Salam alaikum, everybody. So, so um, I remember the first day Eunice made an announcement that if he had, if anybody had any technical wants and needs, that they would make a request, right? So technically, I need you to help me move my furniture on the twentieth. I'm moving into a new apartment. <laughs> so, so um, I was initially set up to make a speech about perfect. I think it was health. And then I literally, right after that, sent Hossein a message and said, change it to health insurance, which he didn't do. So now I'm just going to retaliate, and I'm not doing a speech on any of that. <laughs> and I'm going to do something else. So <laughs> basically what I'm talking about here today is going to be a love. Um, yeah, I know that sounds pretty funny coming from me. But I'm going to talk about love, the love that God puts in the hearts of believers and why he does it. Because I've come to a conclusion that, that the love is a very important thing, and there's, there's more than one reason why God does this. So I'm going to really quick kind of brief over a few things, like a few types of relationships that we, we get in and out of through our, our normally daily lives. Um, and, and a question I want you guys to ponder is, is, is there truly such a thing as unconditional love? Because you periodically hear this from people, and, and it's kind of usually said in a way where it's like almost as, as meaningless as like a superficial greeting. It's like it, it, it's said for poetic reasons, but really, is there, is there really such a thing as um, unconditional love? And, it, and when I think about like the different kind of relationships that we can have during the course of our lives, I'm going to try to start from like the, the, the relationships that we, you know, from, from the lowest to the highest where you would think that love would start and where it would increase. And, you know, you, you have associates at work. You have associates you run into everywhere, just daily people you run into. You kind of know them. You talk to them a little bit each and every day. You don't, obviously, you don't have love for these people. This is really, to me, it's not even possible. Um, however, when you do meet somebody that's an associate and you become, you start, like, building a, 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 a deeper relationship with them, it, this relationship can eventually evolve into a friendship which at that point, there can be a certain kind of love established. And I've had some really good friends in my life. You know, I've had a couple in particularly that, that well, they're both in paradise now. They were, they were both killed. And these two guys, like, there was nothing that they would, they would not stand right next to your side going through. It was like there, it, there would be nothing. It, it, you could be literally looking at what you thought would be the end of the line, and they wouldn't go nowhere. And these are like really good friends, and there's obviously a, a, a love there. Um, but is that love unconditional? Because the truth of the matter is it's not. And in and, 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 and love with friendships, it's conditional on, 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 on the basis that you don't violate the trust that you have with your friends. The same thing, and then you can kind of evolve into family members, and it's kind of a little bit of a different thing for me, because I actually had better friends than I had family members, but a lot of people put a lot of value on, on family members, and I think that's the chronic way because God tells us he puts family at a higher regard in terms of um, um, you know, uh, taking care of the relatives with, 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 with whatever, with, with charity and so forth. But you can really love a lot, some of your family members. You can grow to become very close to them. And this is also like a very conditional love. The only kind of love that I can think of that's almost almost unconditional, but I know it's not absolute, is like the love between a, a, a parent and children. Um, and I believe when I think about logically why God would do this, why God would establish this kind of a love with, between this kind of a relationship, it's a necessity. Because to be quite frank with you, a lot of the submitters in this room, you guys really have good children, but you have no idea. Maybe you do. I don't know. There's a lot of tyrants out there. And, and if God didn't establish this kind of a bond between parents and children, you would literally see children abandoned everywhere. You would like be maybe driving down this freeway and somebody would literally pull over and throw their kids out. That's how it would be because like kids can be really hard to deal with. And if that bond wasn't there, it would be literally impossible, I think, to spend 18, 20 years with this, this person if you, if you didn't have, it was like the same love you had for a friend. I mean, they'd be out the door. But one, there's, there is an exception to this rule that's very interesting, and I've noticed it from the first day I was in this mission, and I, and I walked into the first master that I ever, I, I ever experienced with submitters in Los Angeles, and, and it's the love between believers. 
You can literally be on an associate level with a believer, not know a thing about them. And the second you lock eyes with them, you know they're believers. Like I saw the, the sparkle in these people's eyes. I loved them instantly. And this is like something that it's very special because you didn't have to have any kind of a built relationship for that. It just happens instantly. But the question is, is this also a conditional love or unconditional? And, and, and no, it's actually very, very conditional. And I've learned this over the years. I used to think it was unconditional and I was, I was extremely wrong for that. So I'm going to read some conditions for love, and these are, this is, comes from God's perspective. Um, God loves. Now, mind you, all of these things that I'm saying here all start with God loves. God loves the repenters, the righteous, the charitable, the steadfast, the good doers, those who trust in him, those who are benevolent, those who are equivalent. Or, I'm sorry, equ equ equitable, equivalent. <laughs> I don't know about that one. But those who purify themselves those who are just, those who fight in his cause, united in one column, like the bricks in the wall. These are, these are the attributes that God loves. Um, now there's conditions for being, a, for, ha, for in order, literally to have God have abhorrence for you. And I want to real quick step off to the side and give you guys, you know, I'm sure you guys know what the word abhorrence means, but maybe you don't. It's a very, very serious and severe word. If you look at synonyms for this word, there are some synonyms that I can think off the top of my head are loathe, um, hatred, disgust, repulsed. Like literally, this, this is a very serious word, and God literally has this for some people. Um, God dislikes every disbeliever, evildoers. God does not love the aggressors, the disbelievers, the betrayer, guilty, the unjust. So we can see here that love is very conditional with God. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought someone was talking to my bad. Um, so, like, love is very conditional, okay? And, and um, which is really kind of interesting because people walk into religion for, I think, the wrong reasons a lot of the times. They, 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 I, I don't know what it is with people, but, but, Generally, there's this, this, this consensus with people that when they come to a religion, they think that it's going to be about this group of people that just like loves everything. And it doesn't matter what it is. Like you're going to find a reason to, yeah, I love that. And it's really a, it's really a, a, a pretty big misnomer. And one of the, you know, I, I, I ponder that and I'm like, I think like, why is it that, that people can reach this kind of conclusion? And there's at least, I mean, I could come up with a whole bunch of things that I reflect on it long enough, but two things that stand out to me instantly is, one, they don't know why we're here, right? This is the biggest thing, because, like, you look at all the different religions with Christianity, traditional Islam, Judaism, none of them actually know why we're here. They are all following this whole set of rules that they have, or at least trying to, mostly man-made, but none of them know why we're here. It's literally like giving a person a bunch of ingredients to something with no recipe. They don't know what to do with it. And they have no context to what it is they're following or why. So to, the, to me, and the second reason I think is I feel like a lot of people, they live, they go through life fairly miserable. And, and you, you notice that a lot of people, when they get, they, they hit these hardcore downs, they start looking for religion. And uh, I believe a lot of people come to religion with a lot of baggage on, you know, they're carrying around in their back a lot of resentment. They've built up this animosity. They can't forgive people. And it eats away at them. So I, I feel like people literally come to religion just looking for a way or something that will give them permission to forgive people and to let things go. And again, so they're going to come with this mentality that, you know, this is all about love. And especially in Christianity, which I was, you know, I came from, um, they teach you that Jesus pretty much loved everybody, which is simply not true if you read the Bible. That man did not love everybody. He was pretty. He was pretty, pretty harsh. In fact, probably harsher than I've ever been when he spoke to like the religious leaders. L he said things to them that you can literally see he loathed them. He didn't. He there was no love whatsoever from him. Um, so, hold on. Let me catch my. Uh, okay, just want to make sure I know where I am. So I'm trying to run through this guys quickly. So why am I talking about this? All right. And the reason I'm talking about this is because I'm going to tie all this in in, in a moment. Um, love, love is there, 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 this thing with love that God puts in our hearts. It's, it, it's, to me, it's almost like an algorithm. 
I don't know how else to explain it. it it's not uh, like I used to think that like when God knows he knows you're a believer, he knows you're a believer. So he's going to just pound this emotion into your heart, right? And I used to think that. I used to think that love was just a static emotion that God would put into your hearts just because he knew two people were believers. But as I got deeper into submission, I realized this wasn't the, tr wasn't the way it worked. So I had to figure out why, and I started thinking about it. And it's actually, the love is actually dynamic, and it has to be because you can literally lose the love for another person, another believer. And you have to ask yourself, if, if, if love is static, it's a static emotion, how does that happen? Um, it happens based on guidance. So we don't love each other because God put a static emotion in us. We love each other because God put characteristics in each of us that we recognize. And he, if you're guided by God, he puts something in you that gives you the ability to, to recognize what is good and what is bad. So when you see what is good, you love it. This explains why submitters can literally chip away at the love that, they, that, that other submitters have for them by doing things that are horrible. Like we do things to each other sometimes where we get in these personal disputes with each other and it becomes hard to love a person. Like, and, and this explains that because we're seeing qualities coming from a person that's supposed to be a believer that aren't from God and the love starts to diminish. So the, the reason why I think this is so significant, and I'm going to read you guys a couple verses right now. So here's, here's, here's what I'm, I want to quickly summarize what I'm, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make, because I'm kind of going really fast here. I'm trying to establish that there is a, the, that in order to make the correct decisions in religion, to, to know who to love and to, who to hate, because this religion isn't about just love, it's also about hate. We have to love and hate for the sake of God. The messenger of the covenant literally says this verbatim, word for word, and he talks about love and hate being only for the sake of God, not for personal reasons. And God teaches us in 49.7 how, how this mechanism works. And now that God's messenger has come in your midst, had, you, had, had he listened to you in many things, you would have made things difficult for yourselves. But God made you love faith and adorned it in your hearts. And he made you abhor, abhor, disbelief, wickedness, and disobedience. These are the guided ones. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. We all see how we, I don't really need to, to focus on the love part because we see that love in this room. We love each other because we see qualities that God has taught us are correct. We know it's correct when we see certain behaviors coming from submitters, so we love them. Um, but I'm going to give you an example of how if God doesn't give you this key element, this formula, and he doesn't put it into you, I'm going to give you, give you an example of how disastrous this can actually be. So I just was on Facebook the other day, yesterday as a matter of fact, and I read this statement by somebody. Now we have this thing happening in our community right now, it's, and I'm, I'm talking about like the global community. There's this guy that's kind of alluding to people that he's a messenger. He's, he's, he's already got like one person who's like literally thinks he's a messenger. And many of us have talked to this man and we've literally asked him, you know, are you a messenger? And he won't deny it. Like he just, he just beats around the bush and he says, well, the proof's in the sun and the whatever. You know, he gives you all these crazy, crazy things he says to you. But um, actually, just to make a point, Rod, would you please stand up? Please. <laughs> Are you an authorized messenger of God? <laughs> See, this is the way it should be. When you ask another submitter who is a believer this question, there shouldn't be anything but a no that comes out of your mouth. And I can, I can literally look at, I can literally make an announcement or a question to this whole room. Is there a, any authorized messenger in this room? Okay, it's simple as that. So we have a person that's committing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk later. Um, so anyways, like, this, guy, this is a well-known thing. It's actually starting to erupt in different arguments in different places now. And this is like one of the most evil things that God defines that a person can do. He literally calls these people like, like of the most wicked people on earth. Now, you've got another guy that knows about all this, and what does he say? And I want to put this in perspective. Noah did a really beautiful sermon where he, he showed like the amazing qualities of God and how like, how infinitely large the universe is. And 
to even add to that, you can even you can even shrink down on a on a, on a subatomic level, and if you could become the size of an electron, the, the that one atom is equally as big in terms of size. You can't see from one end of it to another. This is the greatness of God. God is literally telling us that He abhors this individual who is doing this. He hates him. He's repulsed by him. He looks at this person as one of the worst evil people on earth, right? And now here you got this guy on Facebook that's going to stand there. He's going to pop his head out of the crowd. He's going to raise his hand. He's going to say, that's my friend. This is what he did, literally. This is what he did. That's my friend, right? So when you don't have like the guidance from God to be able to recognize evil, to be like what and, 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 and as I see it applied in this verse, when God gives you this, he gives you this knowledge to be able to discern what is wrong and what is right, this is the kind of thing you're going to do. You're not going to be able to recognize what's wrong, and you're going to direct your love towards the wrong people. And then, to make matters worse, the same individual is going to direct abhorrence, animosity, and hatred, and everything else negative that he should be directing at that evil man towards the believers who are fighting this guy. So you see how it can be backwards if a person doesn't have this algorithm put into their heart from God. It's so important. And for a guided person, this, 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 this thing that I'm talking about, it can actually be used to our advantage. I actually make a lot of decisions about how I treat people based on, on, on this very simple concept. Um, so there's a verse in the Quran I'm going to read it to you. How, how much, where am I at time? Okay, 488, why should you divide yourself into two groups regarding hypocrites among you? God is the one who condemned them because of their own behavior. Do you want to guide those who are sent astray by God? So I'm not going to finish the verse. We all know the verse. This is a really tough verse for a lot of submitters. And we see that a lot of submitters, they get into this, this area where they start defending these hypocrites because they're not sure about what's going on. And the, the, the problem is that they're actually doing what God is saying not to do in this verse. But if they just took a step back, stopped, and really just focused on the issue instead of like the behavior of the way one person's talking to another one, just stop and think and look at what this person is actually saying that you're, that you're defending. And if you can literally see, if you're guided by God and you can literally see that the things this person is saying are not from God, they're not any of the qualities that we find, the commandments that we've grown to learn in the Quran, and you see this people do not have the love directed towards believers like they're supposed to have, and instead they're directing their love towards other hypocrites, there should be no question about what you should do at this point. Even if the believer doesn't see that, and we see it, we have a responsibility. You know, We inform them, but if you're in that position where you feel like um, you're not sure about a person, that's really all you have to break it down to. Because the one thing I can't say... I'm, 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 I'm almost positive that you can literally kind of detect where a person's at currently by, 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 by looking at these traits in them. The one, one thing I can't say for sure is, you know, can you like be a submitter, not have this trait, and then attain it later? I don't know if it's absolute, if God just gives it to all the believers immediately. I somehow don't think it works that way because you also have to have this level of education that comes along with reading the Quran so you also understand what's right and wrong. But... Like, that's what I do when I see these things going on. I start trying to identify, like, what traits am I seeing from these people? Like, if, if they're, I, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, keep going on. Like, I think I, I tried to make my point. I think I did, I did what I wanted to do. Um, real quick. So, I don't actually also think it's a decision. I think that, I think that this, having this, this, this formula it, it's not like a, a, a decision you make. You just kind of do it. It's part of God's system. Because there's two verses I want to read. One of them, um, it's 2253. God literally says, basically, I'm just going to read the end. The wicked must remain with the opposition. And the other one is 3103. The believers are united. So depending on how we, if we have this formula or not, we're going to go one way or the other. We're either going to love the believers and abhor the disbelievers, or we're going to love the disbelievers and we're going to abhor the believers. And we're just going to go on the path that we're supposed to go into. And it's all based on, on this concept that I have kind of alluded to. Thank you. We do have some, uh, mashallah, we do have some questions and answers. So uh, I'm only going to take a few. Um, uh, 
Uh, I know we're a little bit behind, but I did speak to Brenda. So mashallah, she's okay with us talking about it. I know this is a topic that we do. So we'll start off with Ashcon. Just remember to keep your questions, please, concise, just as fast as you can, and then also answer as concise so we can get as many people. Okay, mashallah, thank you for your speech, Aaron. Um, so one question that I have is that will it be a correct statement to say uh, that God's love is conditional? No. I hope I never made anybody think that. I read, I read all the criterion of what God loves and doesn't love. God's love is only conditional if you, if you attain the, the righteous traits that he has dictated that he loves. So it is conditional. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm like totally missing. Let me just be, be clear if I, I'm, 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 I'm like stuttering too much. I have a stuttering problem when I talk. So um, God's love is absolutely conditional. Absolutely. Right. Ali had a joke. I want to hear it. <laughs> so, Aaron, would you say um, unconditional love is a satanic concept? Absolutely. Either that, or it's a it's a fallacy that people would like to see. 